My name is Olga Maciaszek Sharma, and I have recently joined Pivotal, the Spring Cloud. I'm working mostly on Spring Cloud Contract and Spring Cloud Netflix. Martin? And, and your Twitter handle. Yeah, it's there. <laughs> okay, now so you. <laughs> my name is Martin Krzyszczak. I work uh, also at Pivotal, the Spring Cloud team, uh, working on Spring Cloud Sleuth contracts and CI CD stuff. My Twitter handle is at Krzyszczak, and my blog is too much coding. Come. So, uh, we will have an intro, then we will show some code demos, and then we will have a quick summary. First of all, we need to say about what we don't want to talk. So, we will not be talking about ESBs, XSDs, XSLTs, and so on. We actually might talk about schemas, just to show you that this is not a schema. So what we do not want to do is repeat the mistakes of our predecessors and introduce too much coupling. We don't want to do this code which is just cemented around some schema. What we want to do uh, is a contract-driven approach, but before we speak about this, uh, let's see some vocabulary that we'll use. So a producer is any application that exposes a REST API or sends messages to other applications. A consumer is a service that will consume this REST API or will listen to the messages from the producer. Then we have a contract. So a contract is an agreement on the API, either REST API or messaging API. So these are the rules about how the API will look, what it will return, what requests it will take, and so on. And something that we will talk more about further on are consumer-driven contracts. So these are contracts that are designed and that are changed uh, by, with, the, with, strong, with strong collaboration with the consumer and where the consumer drives the changes and drives the design of the API. So what problems are we trying to solve? Typically when you come to some presentations, people tell you, oh, we have this great solution, it's a silver bullet, it will solve lots of your problems. So we are not that ambitious when it comes to that, but we will be happy if we can solve these two problems. So one problem is the validity and reusability of stubs for integration tests, and the other one is nice API creation. So, let's talk about the first one. We have a typical situation uh, in a microservice ecosystem where we have a consumer and a producer. The consumer sends HTTP messages and gets some responses, and we want to test it because, well, testing is important, we all know this. So, we are trying to test it and make an integration test. However, the problem is that this is only an excerpt of the situation. So, around the producer, we will have other services that the producer will make calls to. We'll have other producers, and we'll have databases. We will have a complex ecosystem. And of course, when we want to test it uh, on some test environment or even on local machine, it is very difficult to recreate our entire ecosystem. So, what do we often do is, creating stops. So we had the producer there and now we have a stop. And there is a variety of tools that help us do this. So one of them is Wiremock, which is an in-memory HTTP server that will return a response when it receives a matching request. Who knows Wiremock? Who uses Wiremock? Okay, there are some people. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you define them, this interaction in a JSON. And as you see here, it's very straightforward. You have a request part where you write which method, what URL, what parameters, and so on, and you have a response part. So whenever you do a request that matches this definition, Wiremock will respond to you with a response that matches the response definition. It's really straightforward, and you can easily use it in your tests. So it's like Mokito on the level of, let's say, HTTP calls, right? Yeah, exactly. So a typical scenario is when we have an app, we want to make these tabs for ourselves. So uh, we will put some JSONs in the mappings directory, and then we can define them. What is very important to see here is that we are on the consumer side. 
So we are the consumer of the API. We just assume the API will look like this, so we make stops. So maybe we have talked to someone from the other service team. Maybe we just think it should look this way. We think this should work. We are making the stop. So we assume that when we make a post on history, we want to receive 201 response and when we make a similar post but with a body containing six, uh, containing six plus six, we want to get a 400. So it is pretty straightforward and we can test it and we can write integration tests around this. What can go wrong? So let's assume we want to use this tool and we are introducing a new endpoint. So our colleagues on the producer side will add a new endpoint. We are supposed to talk to them, get to know which the endpoint name will be, what method we need to use and so on, and what the data format will be. And once they've told us this, we can create our JSON and we have our stops. So that's uh, a non-existent URL for a purpose. We have created the stop, we think this JSON is fine, we think that's our URL. For now, let's leave it here. So what we can do, we can write the integration test, we can write the missing implementation, and we are happy about it. We have tested it against the stub, which is perfect, yeah? So what can go wrong? Did Anything anyone have wrong? such a situation that, you know, you were writing a stub for another service, like, that you didn't own, anybody? Okay, some, quite a few people, okay. Yeah. So we can now deploy it to, to our end-to-end -end environment, or maybe we can even deploy it to production. Yeah, it's tested. Let's do it. Okay, and what can go wrong? So in many cases, in many companies, definitely not in yours, but it does happen. What can happen is actually what you thought the producer was returning uh, doesn't have anything to do with what it's actually returning because that's human communication, that's some good faith, that's some emails maybe, you have no guarantee that the producer behaves the same as you have defined it in your stub. So you're saying that human interaction can be problematic? Maybe. Mm, impossible. Impossible. Okay, so we had the stub and we did our calls and the stub behaved according to our definition, we got an okay, but what if our producer or we had a typo in the stub, or the producer had a typo in the URL, or they used a different method, anything was different. We have no way of knowing while working with the stubs if the stubs have anything, but anything to do with the reality. They could have a bad day one day and decide to switch things up, and we might never know. So there was a situation in one of the companies that I worked where uh, we had this uh, idea of a Boy Scout rule. So whenever somebody went to the code, they needed to, and they saw, you know, some small thing they could fix, they decided that I'm going to fix it to make everybody, uh, everybody's life easier and better. So the thing was that one of the developers saw a typo in the API, right? So this junior developer decided to fix the typo because... That's a normal thing. Wouldn't that's a normal you fix thing. It? Yeah, yeah, because Boy Scout rule, right? So it looks all, bad. all the integration tests for all the consumers of this API were still passing. Because in the stubs, they contain the typo. Of course he fixed the stubs as well. Um, yeah. Of course they didn't. But uh, when we've gone to production, all of our consumers were broken. Yeah, it happened. We have seen this. So it's the same with messaging. So there are a number of frameworks that allow us to stop messaging and pretend that we are actually getting messages on some channel. And we are very happy with this because, of course, we have written the pojos. We are writing the test. It, it just has no way to go wrong. However, actually, the producer can use a slightly different pojo. One field can be different. It, we will not be able to deserialize it correctly. Or there can be a different letter in the topic. We will never know because we have stopped this and we can only be sure that something is in, uh, works the same in the producer if we tested it there and not on our side. Yeah, so that's what can happen. And so coming back to this, the main problem, the stops are on the consumer side, the consumer writes the stops, the consumer has no way of verifying that the stops reflect what is happening in the other app. And then we, will, we can just never know if they're valid. 
And another problem that we can have is that, especially we ha if we have a kind of a solar system architecture with one app, which is used by many consumers to do requests. And typically that happens when you're migrating from yeah, a monolith from a to monolith. microservices, right? Yeah, it's, a, it's often seen in, in this phase. So what happens is that many teams write the same steps, exactly the same, or slightly different, but mostly the same, and they don't talk to each other. So they don't know that they are duplicating all this work, and it doesn't make sense. So there, there should be a way to reuse one's written steps. Of course, as we have seen, exactly the same thing happens with messaging. So anything can go wrong because this stub has no validation. And a second topic that we want to talk about is nice API creation. So if we think about this, very often what happens is that the team that develops the producer app, they are working on the API and they say, okay, so I will do this endpoint. Let's say I will return this object. This looks good to me. I have this in the database, so let's just pass it on. But who really uses the API is the consumers. They are going to live with it, they are going to use it a lot, and they are going to have to write code around it. So they use this data, and they know better which is the format of the data that they need. So in most of the cases, they know better how to make the API, and it's, it's really easy to see. It happens a lot. For me, it happened when I was writing both consumer and producer, and I started with the producer, and then I write the consumer, and I'm like, why have I done it this way? It would be much easier the other way around. But as we work in different teams, we often don't think that the other team can actually have a better idea of how to design this API. So consumers should take part in the creation of the API at least in the same organization. Of course, if we have a public API, it's very difficult to consult with everyone. But if we are working for the same company, we should really try to involve them in this process. And the changes should be driven by consumers. And this collaboration is very important because if we don't collaborate, strange things happen. So here, for example, Unis tests have passed, but the integration tests well, they probably wouldn't, but they were stopped. If so somebody has very thin legs, <laughs> maybe then can pass. You, can, you think so? Yes. Okay. Or here, maybe we had the right messaging channel and the right headers, but one field was different. It was payment result and not payment. Yeah, something went wrong. So we want to show a potential answer to this, which is Spring Cloud Contract, and it addresses both of these problems. And we are going to show it through a demo. We are going to code a small demonstration. We'll have a consumer, which is a service that sells beers. And however, it's a consumer. It's like a, this bartender that is only good at one thing, which is pouring beer. However, he has to ask his manager whether he should or should not sell the beer to any person. So mm, the manager is our producer. And the producer will get requests asking if the beer should be sold. And the feature is that if the user is too young, we do not sell the beer. And if the user has right age, we sell them the beer. And we will first show um, the situation where a consumer has a client that is 22 and is asking if the beer can be sold. So the status should be OK, and the beer should be granted. And then another scenario if the consumer is 17 and wants to buy the beer, the status is not OK, so we tell them to go away. So to make it easier, whenever we are using the black terminal or black ID, we are working on consumer side. We are the consumer team. And whenever we are using the white terminal or white ID, we are the producer. And the demo will have three phases. So the first phase will be on the consumer side. We'll see offline work of the consumer on the contracts. Then we will see producer implementing the features described in the contract. And then we will see how the consumer can switch to, online, um, to using online stubs generated by the producers. OK, so what does the flow look like? So this might seem strange, but at first, the consumer will clone the producer's repository. Why? Because in order to avoid all these problems caused by the stops being on consumer side, 
We want to keep our contract definitions on producer side. So we want the consumer to influence them and even drive the change, but we want to keep them with the producer because as you will see later on, we will want to test them against the producer or rather test the producer against them. So the consumer clones the, the repository and starts working on the contracts and tries to design the best possible contracts. Once they are satisfied with it, they submit a pull request, they have interaction. Of course, the producer team will not agree to everything. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. They can consult it, more teams can get involved, more people can work on it. Then, uh, yeah, and then we'll show the other part in the next phase of the demo. Now let's pray to the demo gods. Yeah, we'll let's see. see how it goes. So, um, the first thing you should ever do, like Josh Long says that, like if your children are less restless, as he says it, or suffer from indigestion, you should go to star.spring.io and generate a Spring Boot project. Do you know this site? Who knows star.spring.io? Quite a few people. And it's really cool because everything is for free. So I'm going to create a bar consumer, and I can pick all the dependencies I want to be there in the project. So it's going to be web. What else can you put there? Let's put Stubrunner. I'm going to see why in a second. Yeah, that's it. So um, it's going to be a Maven Java project based on Spring Boot 205. So let's generate a project. Oh, by the way, you could switch to full version, pick all sorts of stuff over there. There's like, they give it for free, so it's really cool. Um, so let's generate a project. We have the bar consumer. Now uh, it was black. Black terminal. We're on the consumer, consumer side. Consumer. So I'm going to unzip the bar consumer, and I'm going to open the the project. Okay, so what do we have here? Under POM, we have uh, 205 of Spring Boot, the latest release train, which is Finchley SR1, service release one, and we have web test and stub runner, that's it. And the cloud BOM, so bill of materials, all the versions come from the Spring Cloud BOM. Now I have to talk all this time because I'm waiting for the dependencies to resolve because apparently 205 got just released, so I have to download the dependencies. That's why I will continuously speak right now, uh, yeah, all M3 the time. Yeah, got released. Yes, and, and let's... And we did bump it yesterday. Yes, we did. Yes. Are you enjoying the conference? Is it okay? Yes, good. Okay, so maybe I'm going to show you that in a different way. Let's wait for this. I'm going to show you an antique tool called the Midnight Commander. And I'm going to show you what we have here. So we have uh, pretty much source main Java. And it's just a Spring Boot application. Nothing special, nothing happening there. Um, let's see what we have in the tests. OK, I, we're back. To go. So let's see what we have on the test side. Uh, whoops, nothing special, just a simple test. So as everybody here, uh, I'm going to start with the test, right? Always, always with the test. Uh, so what we want to do is like, uh, should grant a beer if old enough, something like this. Now, um, I'm a consumer. The producer side hasn't written a single line of code. Do I really know how the API should look like? I don't, I really don't know. even yeah. probably know yet that you want this functionality. Yeah, but let's say that there should be like given maybe some sort of a person when we ask uh, for, let's say, validity or something like this, uh, given a person with age 22, let's say, right? Then the beer should be granted. Now, I don't know what the person should look like even, right? That's, it, it's tricky. So I could file a ticket to the producer side, but they have 25 sprints planned ahead. So in like 50 weeks, because there's going to be a delay, they could provide me with some sort of with a stub. With an end point. Yeah, with an end point that I can test against to see even, even if I want this feature. So or a JSON before yeah. they even make the end point. So, so, so that's bad. So what we're going to do is, like Olga said, um, we're going to clone the producer. And I have already done it. So you can see producer clone. Because I don't trust in cloning stuff during conferences. So I'm going to uh, just open the clone. Let's see what's going to happen. Assuming that I delete, yeah, of course, something has to happen. Uh, so we're opening the project. We're opening the project. 
What do we have in the poem? Uh, in the poem, actually that's pretty important, uh, we have a different version of boot and uh, cloud, but the important thing that we have is that we have a special plugin over here, Spring Cloud Contract Maven plugin. Uh, what it does, we're going to see in a second, uh, but it's a very important plugin that, uh, let's say, will help us with the contract piece. Okay, so we have the producer clone. Let's see what we have here. As I mentioned, no production code other than this producer application, so there's no implementation of the feature. Uh, we have a single class that does nothing, so we have no tests, right? So what we're going to do is um, we have a... Whoops, that shouldn't be here. Uh, what we have is, uh, let's say, our two folders, source test resources contracts, and we have a folder called bar consumer and foo consumer. So as a reminder, the, uh, our consumer application is called bar consumer. So we have a special folder, folder prepared for, for us. So now, as bar consumers, on the producer side, we will suggest a contract. So we will create a contract can be defined uh, using YAML or Groovy. I'm going to do it in Groovy to show you that Groovy is not a bad thing. We recommend Groovy. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to call it should return, uh, should uh, grant a beer if old enough. And now I, we recommend Groovy, or I personally recommend Groovy because my memory is absolutely terrible. And I never remember the syntax, never remember the number of indents in the YAML. And neither do I. Yeah, so it's difficult. So I prefer the compiler to help me. So what I can type is contract make. It's a function, right, a, a method. And now I guess we need a request and a response, right? Yeah, so same as in the JSON before. Yeah, so, so request and response. Okay, so ID helps me all the time. Now, let us assume that we would send you know, a method post, maybe. What do you think? Makes sense? Post. Post looks fine. URL, let's say check. Um, headers. It's going to be a JSON, right? Yeah, so content type. Uh, content type application JSON. Now some so, some body would be good. So let's say that. Um, so in H. Groovy, yeah, in Groovy, uh, you can define let's say JSON via the map notation. So it's like key value. Uh, so we're going to represent this using this map notation. So name, let's say, Marcin, and age, um, 22? Yeah. Uh, it's not, it's unfortunate. <laughs> Let's assume yeah. 22. I wish. State is okay. I never remember the codes, you know, so let's put okay. Uh, headers, uh, content type, application JSON, and now the body. Another way of defining the body is actually use a multi-line string. Who loves writing a JSON in Java? Nobody, that's good, because uh, actually doing all sorts of things like this is really annoying. So what we can do is do a multi-line string in which all of the things will be um, escaped. So I can type in a normal string. So status would be what? Okay. And yeah. let's say name will be uh, Marcin. Hopefully that's this good. is a valid JSON this time. Uh, so let's create another one, should reject a beer if too young. So that's going to be 17 and status not okay. So now as a consumer, I have defined two contracts that I think would be valuable to write a test against. Yeah, go ahead. Come again. No, no, no. So, uh, so the, the suggestion was to change the response status as well. We always return OK for the sake of the demo, to make things simple. Uh, but that's a, uh, that's a valid point. Um, so that, that's just the, let's say, the content, right? To, to play around with the content uh, of the response. Uh, so the cool thing to show here is that different consumers can have different needs for the same endpoint, right? So let's say that there is a bar consumer, but there's also a foo consumer. And now, the foo consumer in the response wants a surname, not a name. Surname. Is it a valid thing? Why not? If, if, if that, this is what the, the, the other consumer requires, then why not? So now what we're going to do is we are going to the producer clone, and we're going to do the thing that you, let's say, never do with your code. 
We're going to do Maven clean install. What's your favorite switch? Skip tests, of course. So uh, why do we do it? Because I told you about the Maven plugin. So the Maven plugin does a couple of things. The first thing that it does is that it's converting the DSL, the contract, into a stub. Contract into a stub. The other thing that happens is that from the contract, we generate tests to see if the producer is not lying. But since there is no implementation and we're just prototyping, we don't want to run any tests, right? Because we just want to prototype with the API. So if we scroll down, and I didn't do anything wrong, the third thing that the plugin does, that it's packaging the stubs into a separate jar that con uh, uh, with a classifier stubs. And these are the same looking stubs as we saw before for wire mocks. So Correct. So those look like this. So if we had a, a mapping for bar consumer, should grant the BRF old enough, we will have a JSON definition. Uh, sorry. Uh, we'll have a JSON definition of a, a wire mock stub saying if you send a request to URL check with method post and content type matches application JSON, and we parse the JSON into JSON paths, and we analyze if the field age is equal to 22, if field uh, name is Marcin. If that's the case, the state is going to be 200, and body is going to be what you see. You so we do all the hideous stuff for you, like embedding a JSON in a JSON. Yeah, you don't need to do this. The plugin will Precise. do it for you. Uh, the question was, could I? Uh, the question was, could I invoke the uh, goal of the plugin to do this? Yes, I could, but this is much faster to show. <laughs> We've skipped this. Uh, yes, I could execute a goal of the Maven plugin to just do conversion, and it's actually the goal is called convert, right? Uh, so we installed the stubs locally, right? They are called com example is the group ID. The artifact ID is called sorry for this beer API producer with stubs per consumer. I have a bad feeling of naming, apparently. So uh, let's go back to our consumer. So now we more or less know what we want to do. So we have a class person. Uh, was there what? It was a name. name. It was, is it the bar the, or the, the full consumer? Which uh, one we is are, that? We are the bar consumer. Okay, so, so that so was a name. Yeah, so name and age. So let's create the constructor. So if you've, if you've been to my first presentation, you know that there is this fellow Jackson that makes a lot of problems. I'm going to create all the getters and setters, so <laughs> there's no problem for sure with sending the data. So I'm going to create a new person. It was Marcin H22. Uh, and now we ask, for, you know, we want to send the request. So we're going to do new uh, REST template. And let's try to get for, uh, or let's do exchange request entity, uh, we're going to send a, was it a post? Yep. Post to URI. Check. HTTP localhost, localhost 9876, slash check. Uh, okay. Uh, the body will be the person, uh, and the response will be of, uh, oh yeah, and we need the response. So. Let's put a response over here, class response, response, string status, and string name, correct? Yeah. Let's create all sorts of stuff. Select none. Okay, and we're going to do getter and setter. Response class, let's return this. And now let's assert some stuff, BDD assertions, then exchange get status code value is equal to 200. And exchange get body name should be Marcin. And let's say status should be OK. Who thinks that if I run this test, it's going to pass? OK, one person. Let's run it. I suspect that we're going to get a connection refused because we didn't start anything, right? So we're just sending a request. If we don't get connection refused, something is wrong. OK, connection refused. So we send a request and you know nothing's there. So now what we can use uh, is some sort of a tool to run stubs. 
How would you name a framework that runs Stubs? Hmm, maybe Stub Runner. Stub Runner, that's a very good name. So let's use auto configure Stub Runner. And we're going to say, we want you to fetch the stubs of an artifact or like a uh, producer called group ID is com example. Artifact ID is the one I have to paste because I'm going to make mistakes. Beer API producer with stubs per consumer, insane. Uh, and uh, I want to register it at a random port, right? So by default, it's going to pick the latest version with a classifier stubs, but I want, don't want to hard code on the port. Why? Because if I want to run stuff in parallel, I don't want to bind to a concrete port. I always want to pick a random one. So I'm going to say, uh, pick the stubs from my local M2, right? Because on the, in the clone, I installed the stubs locally, right? So if we go here, we see that under my... Yeah, before, while running the clean install, yeah? Yeah, so over here, when I did uh, clean install uh, skip tests, what happened is in my local M2, the stubs of the producer got installed, right? Uh, I'm going to say stubs per consumer equals true. You'll see why in a second. And uh, consumer name will be bar consumer, it was. Yeah. So now if I didn't do anything stupid, which for sure I've done, uh, what should happen is something different than connection refused. It's still red. Oh, I didn't actually, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm stupid. Uh, so the stub was ran on a random port, but I didn't pass the port, right? Fair enough. So at least the framework yeah, is running. Yeah, we used the fixed one. So what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to ask for the port. I'm going to say, please inject the port into the field. And now I'm going to pass the port. Good. So right now, that should be better. We'll see. OK. It's even green, much to my surprise. So what happened? Let's uh, find stop download. OK. So let's check out the logs. What happened? So what happened is we said that we want to fetch the stubs from local Maven repository because I passed the local piece. Then what happened is I didn't provide any specific version. So Sprinkler contract said, oh, you want the latest one. I'm going to fetch it for you. And it says, oh, you know what? I've resolved the version in your local M2 to be 001 snapshot. Then what happened is we started in memory wire mock instance, so HTTP server, uh, stub of the HTTP server, and it's running on port 11,238 because it was picked, a and a random port was picked. What happened next is this random, uh, th th this, um, let's say, started HTTP server was fed with the following definition of a stub. Rings a bell? Yes, it's exactly the one that you've seen on the producer side. So, like, to, to cut the and story And it's short, the wire mock underneath. Yeah, so... Oh, we just run it for you. You don't need to do it on your own. So, as you can see, over here, with all the uh, infrastructure that is really, like, not a lot of code to write, we will start a HTTP server stub and feed it with stubs. So right now, you can think of consumer-driven contracts as TDD on the level of architecture, because I had a re red, I had connection refused. Now I have green, and I've managed to send a real request, right? And got a real response. So now I say, hmm, that is kind of uh, bad that I have to, you know, pass this value of the age, like have it fixed. Maybe I will make it dynamic. Let's check it out. So I go back to my contracts and I say, OK, how about we make it dynamic in such a way that I will call a fantastic method called dollar. And I'm going to say that a regular expression would be s make sense here. And now, since um, it's very easy to write a regular expression for an age greater than 20, so let's assume that this is the case, that you're old enough to get the beer. So I'm going to say 2 to 9 is the first digit, and 0 to 9 is the second, right? <laughs> and should reject if it's not the case. And now I have to do 0 to 1. Of course, 0, 7 is not a valid number, but it's just like between you and us, OK? Uh, so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to install this again with skipping tests. So on the, in the clone, 
I am rebuilding the stubs. I'm installing them locally. And if you check out the stub over here, of course, everybody knows that this is a valid regular expression check for a JSON path, right? Everybody knows it and loves it. So now what I can do on the consumer side is say, OK, how about I do 54 over here? Of course, age may be not the best idea, but imagine that you have time or you UUID. Have an ID. Yeah. Exactly. So in this case, you can provide a, let's say, dynamic piece. So yet another thing, consumer driven. So every consumer can have different needs. Right now, we fetched stubs for the bar consumer. How about we say that, you know, we're actually full consumer. So full consumer requires some different data to be returned in the response. So if that's the case, suddenly our tests stop passing. Why is it so? And that's because we, we needed a surname. We needed a, a name. A, we needed a surname and nothing really worked. It turned out that uh, uh, we, we, I, I created even a wrong stub or something like this. So we, we start getting an invalid response, and that's exactly what we wanted to achieve. So right now, as a consumer, let's say I'm very happy with the API. So I didn't have to ask anybody to provide me any stubs, right? I created myself. I like the, the, the um, API. That can be especially useful when you're doing something with the UI, right? You're prototyping the UI. You can also prototype the required API. So right now, I create a pull request to the producer side where uh, I'm going to say that this is the API that I would like to be done. Yeah, so the producer will take over the PR and, of course, has to implement it. And my favorite thing about this is that they have no way of building the code with this PR until they implement it. Because as we have automatically generated the stops, so what we will show you now is that the plugin will generate the automated test for you. That will check if the producer really provides this API. So once the build pass and uh, we are sure that they implemented it exactly the way it should be, they can then go with, uh, with the code through the CI CD pipeline and can push the artifact to the artifact repository and the artifact will be pushed with the stubs. So they will go together, the application and the stubs that we know that are valid because they were tested. Okay. And now the white screens. The white screens. There we go. We are on the branch called pull request, and we're in the producer uh, code. So there's already something written here, so we don't waste time. Uh, we have the producer controller. Uh, as we've seen in the contract, we have a you know method check, uh, sorry URL check, method post, application JSON is consumed and uh, returned. There is an interface that checks if the person is eligible to get the beer. You can see should get beer. There's no implementation. Nothing working. Uh, and we have the, the contracts there. Uh, we have no tests. We have just some sort of a class. Base right? class. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to do a clean install. And we'll see what's going to happen. I expect everything to work smoothly. Whoops. Hmm. Hmm. What happened? Let's see. So some tests were failing. Bar consumer tests and have food consumer tests. Have you written that test? I didn't write them. Have you? No. It's like in a very pathetic commercial, right? <laughs> so uh, let's go to target, generated test sources, and we'll see that, oh, we have bar consumer and food consumer tests. What are those? So we have, under bar consumer, should grant a beer if old enough. Hmm. It looks exactly as the file over here. So in the file, we said method post, URL check, age, name, content type, status, name. What do we have in the test? We are sending a request via a framework called rest assured uh, with a header content type application JSON with body H matching the regular expression that got generated. So 62 is greater than 20. Name is Marcin. And we send the post method uh, with the post method to do URL check. We send the request. We expect status to 100. We expect content type to be application JSON. And we expect the, um, let's say, fields in the response to be there. So this is something that comes uh, gets generated by the plugin, meaning if you, you as a producer are not compliant with the contract, we will break your build. Now, there are cases, you know, you have to set up some context, set up some stuff, so uh, the uh, generated test extended base class. 
So what we need to do is tell Rest Assured that we have a single controller. Uh, it's called was producer controller. Yeah. Now, we inject via constructor. We need a person checking service to be, uh, let's say, you know, uh, injected. Now, a very important thing related to contract tests. Contract tests do not replicate business logic. If you were to go to the database and send 25 requests to know whether the person can get the beer or not, you don't want to actually do it. What you want to do is verify the semantics, if we can communicate. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to inject a, f let's say, fake Stop. service. So it's going to be new person checking service, which happens to be a fantastic lambda. And I'm going to say, and now we can, let's say, simulate, agree with, uh, let's say, our consumers. What age do we agree upon that means that you, you know, you, you're eligible or not. So in our case, we assumed that the age is 20. So we're going to say age greater or equal to 20. Even though from the business perspective, for example, you have to be 18 or 21. This, these are contract tests. We just need to agree upon something. So now I can go to the, to the test. I can run it. And I should have an exception. That something is wrong because I didn't write a single line of production code, right? Good. So it failed. Why? Because of nil. There's no response. So let me fix it. Um, if person checking service should get a beer, person to check is true, return new response, beer check status should be OK, and we pass the name over here. Otherwise, please return not OK. So right now what I can do is I can run this again. And the both tests pass, which means that I am compliant with the contract. Now, uh, why consumer drink contract makes a lot of sense from the point of view of the producer? That's because I exactly know which consumer is using which part of my API in what way, because that's explicitly defined in the contract. So let us assume that for some reason I, I, am, I am insane and I do something that you never do in your companies. So I've decided to remove a field from the response because ah, nobody uses it, right? So I'm just going to remove you know, just remove it. So let me just, you know, try to run the build. And of course, you know, it has to pass not, right? Because the generated tests have said that the foo consumer requires the field surname equal to much. So right now, I know exactly which consumer uses my API in what way, and I can ping the, uh, the which team, the foo team, saying, you know what, the other team uses its name, you're using surname, can't you use the same thing if you use it? Like, if you, if you migrate to it, it's going to be easier for us to support less stuff. So from the point of view of the producer, you exactly know who uses what in what way. Yeah, and even if you want to go around and you will change the contract as well, the consumers will know because they will get stops which don't match their tests and their tests will fail and they will know something's wrong. Yeah. So if somebody uh, actually... Uh, because this is evil, you shouldn't just change yeah. contracts, but even if you do, they will know. So if somebody changes uh, the contracts in a, uh, in a breaking way and they do it deliberately without telling the supervisors about it, most likely they should get fired. Uh, because that mean, yeah. that's going to mean a lot of uh, problems for everybody in the company. So now as a producer, once I merge the branch, what the CI would do is it would call something like clean deploy and the stubs would be uploaded to Nexus or Artifactory. And from the point of view of the um, of the producer, we are done. Yeah, I just by the way, you can also get these tests generated in Spock. So if you prefer Spock or JUnit 5, it will work. So now we are back. Yeah, sorry. We are back to the consumer, and our consumer wants to use now not anymore the stubs that they installed and they generated on their local machines. They want to use the stubs that were uh, deployed to the artifact repository. And then they know for sure that what they're testing is exactly uh, what the producer behaves like. So let's see this part. So last thing, we go back to the black thing. And over here, we say we want the remote mode, not the local one, remote. And 
the root of the let's say um, of these of the software with uh, uh, artifacts so like nexus or uh, artifact trees for example uh, repo spring io slash libs milestone local that means that uh, a sprinkler contract will search for those uh, artifacts in that particular repository so that can be your local nexus in your company and for example as olga said if somebody changes uh, the, the the stubs you will fetch them every single time you run the tests and if those changed and you're not compliant with them your builds as consumers will break okay so we've done the demo and now what if we cannot clone the repository of the producer so that's bizarre. I never thought that was possible, but actually in some banking and other organizations when they have special security regulations, you cannot do it. And we know this because we got issues about that. So what you can do instead is keep all the contracts in a separate repository. The process looks the same, but just the consumer will have, will, it will have one additional step where both parts uh, take the contracts or submit the contracts to an additional repository. Now, we have all this information about the consumers and producers of our app. We know what the consumer A is, uh, is taking from a producer, but maybe the consumer can be also a producer of another consumer. So we have a graph. And we, in our samples, in Spring Cloud contract samples, we provide a test that if you have the contracts, will allow you to sketch a graph of your dependencies in your system. What if you don't like Groovy DSL, even though it's awesome? You can still use YAML. And it's who loves YAML? Yeah. Who, okay. has, who has seen the meme with the guy having, uh, you know, checking the indents on the monitor of the YAML so that there are no you know, additional spaces? You have to check it out. It's on Twitter. It's awesome. Yeah, but if you see the YAML, even though it's only a YAML, it still looks pretty much uh, understandable and intuitive and similar to the JSON. So that's the YAML. And how many of you use ResDocs, Spring ResDocs? Res or MockMVC. Okay. Who uses Spring MockMVC? So, um, yeah, yeah, the ResDocs allow you to actually generate documentation from your test. It's an interesting topic. You can read about it. We are not going to speak about it because it's for a whole entire new talk. But if you do use it, it can generate stubs for you out of the box. And if you use one additional method call, it can also generate contracts for you. Yeah, that's what it looks like. And just to summarize, we have a, an API now that suits both the producer and consumer. We have reusable, uh, readable and intuitive contracts. The contracts, which is most important, are tested against the producer, so we get stops that reflect what the producer does. And we also, the plugin does for us the starting and setting up stops and running them, it's fully automated. Why sprinkler contract? There is also messaging, both messaging and REST support. We support also non-Spring projects, so you can use a rule. We were using auto configure stub runner annotation, but you can also use a rule and it will work as well. And also we have a Docker project for non-JVM projects. And the tests are automatically generated. You don't need to do this. We have a separate stub runner functionality that will uh, launch the wire mock underneath and run everything for you. And the stubs can be taken from uh, artifactory on a, or other repository, but they can also be taken from the class path. And it works seamlessly with other Spring Cloud services. So if you are using service discovery, Spring Cloud contract will stub it for you as well, automatically, out of the box. And we also provide a separate stub runner boot app for running the stubs. And there's a lot more information and documents and samples on our websites. If you're interested to go there and do write to us uh, on Gitter, but preferably read the documentation first <laughs> and then <laughs> write on Gitter. Yeah, please I mean, who, read the, who reads the docs, right? Yeah, yeah. why? What for, wh why do they even write them, yeah? So okay. I guess that's it from our yeah. side. We're not going to change the slide to questions because I guess you're taking there's pictures. There's not enough time. <laughs> so. 
Uh, but yeah, do try using it. Try if you have any issue, submit it. If you have a great idea, submit a pull request. It's an open source project. Everybody can participate. Yeah. Any questions? Any questions? So if you have no questions or just shy, then yeah. approach us. Do we have time for questions? I guess we can have one or yeah? two. Okay. But there are no questions, time. so there's nothing to take, actually. <laughs> so if uh, you're shy, just come here and let's chat. And that's it from our side. Thank you. Thank you.